Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Karina. It's beautiful. Let's stand and join in our call to worship and welcome. God alone is worthy of our worship and praise. Let us humble ourselves that we might hear God's voice. Let us bow down before the Lord, confessing our sins and seeking God's aid as individuals and as the world. Lord Jesus, fill our hearts with your love. Help us to follow you closely without hesitation. Amen. And please remain standing if you are able and join in Be Thou My Vision 451. join together in the opening prayer. O creator and mighty God, you have promised strength for the weak, rest for the laborers, light for the way, grace for the trial. Welcome again. Glad you're here today. I know it's a little more warm here probably than in your homes and so thank you for coming on a warm muggy day. And thank you to Robin Clark for bringing some Narthex. If you didn't get some, feel free to go out and get a, get a bottled water to keep you cool. That was a nice touch. So um, as we look at our announcements, we have a couple of things that we want to draw to your attention. Uh, one is that next week, or this coming week, at the end of the week, Bruce is leaving for Nicaragua. So welcome, Bruce. And we talked to Bruce about his trip, and we've posted Again, his itinerary and the project he'll be working on. This is one of the conference volunteer and mission trips, and there are many. So if anyone's interested on the NIAC website, you can find out about other countries where we send New York annual conference volunteer and mission teams. So please let us keep Bruce in our prayers as he leaves on the 5th uh, for safe travels and a great trip, a great trip. Thank you again to all who took part in the midnight run recently. And then, of course, if you're contemplating going to Nicaragua in 2017, Amy and Carol would like to hear from you. So there's more information in the bulletin about the timing of two trips this year. So begin to pray, if you haven't already, about whether you'll be going on one of those trips as well. August 14th, we'll be having the interment of Anita Holmes in our memorial garden and a little service to remember her and honor her. I hope you can come for that as well. I did want to, to share with you that um, Reverend Bill Shillady, who used to be pastor here, gave the benediction at the Democratic National Convention. And so this is not a partisan politics announcement, but just an FYI that's kind of interesting to know that one of the pastors here had the honor of being asked by either party. That's pretty, uh, pretty neat. So you can actually find his benediction on YouTube. It is on YouTube. In fact, you'll have more luck hearing it on YouTube. I found I tried to tune in and the commentators were talking right over it, which they also did at the Republican convention, I noticed. So it seems like the benedictions or closing prayers of the conventions are not um, fully respected as they should be by the, by the news network. So maybe we should write a little, little note and say, please hold your commentary till after the closing prayer. Um, but you can see it on YouTube if you want to see what he said. Um, he had everyone join hands. Um, so that was certainly in the spirit of Methodism. Very warm uh, blessing to everyone who happened to be there. So uh, those are the announcements for this morning. And we hope you'll join us for some coffee and fellowship afterward. And uh, 
So we'll continue with our worship. I'm going to invite the kids to come up now. We'll start with the most easy one, which is on the bottom. I think this one's the easiest one. What's the emotion? Happy. Everybody knows happy face, right? Happy face. Sad. That one's pretty good and easy too, right? How about this one? Angry. Good. How did you know it was angry? The eyebrows. That was the clue. The eyebrows. You know. I, that's how I tried to show angry because I did this one too without the eyebrows. What do you think that might be? Surprised. It could be surprised. This was actually my picture for scare. If you're afraid, you might go, oh, and your eyes kind of open bigger, right? So that's for fear, being afraid. And then we have one more. And this one relates to the reading that the adults will hear today about something Jesus told someone. That one's a little hard to figure out. What might it be? Happy. Happy sad. <laughs> this one's kind of in between with a little wrinkled lip. This was actually me trying to do a face for jealous or upset because Jesus talked to a man who was jealous because his older brother inherited money when his father died and he said, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He was jealous. Do you ever get jealous of somebody? You don't have to say who. <laughs> but do you ever get jealous of somebody else? You want what they have, or you want to be like them, or you want to have the friends they have, and whatever it might be. So sometimes we get jealous. So that was the jealous face, a little harder to draw. What I wanted to talk to you about today is the fact that Jesus experienced, when he walked the earth, all of those emotions that we go through. Happy, sad, jealous, angry, all of those. Isn't that interesting? He felt all those different things. Can you think of a time Jesus was happy? Basically all the time. Wow. When he was born, probably felt the love of Mary, right? And Joseph, and then those who came to see him. I don't think he was happy all the time because he experienced all the different emotions we do. So there were some times when he was sad, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I think what you're getting at is that deep down, he was happy that he was loved by his Father in heaven, and he had that peace inside, right? So I know what you're saying by that. Um, times that I thought about was when he had children around him, he was very happy. He said, let the children come to me, because he liked to spend time with the children. So he's very happy with the children, like yourselves. Um, also, when he got to talk to the teachers in the temple, he was happy about that, because he wanted to talk about God with them. How about when he was feeding people? Do you think he was happy when he could feed the hungry people? Yeah. yeah. Thousands, yeah. Thousands of people. Like with the bread and the fish. Very good. And then what else did he do with the sick people? What did he do that made him happy? They did ask him to help. Many people brought their friends who were sick to him and sick people called out to him, and often he would heal them, right? Beautiful. So it made him happy because they had faith that he could help them, and they, they saw God's work in him, and they worshipped and honored him, and thanked him good. They had gratitude, and they were happy to be fed made well by him. So it made him happy when he could help somebody. When was Jesus sad? When people die, good. The Bible says when his friend Lazarus died, Jesus cried. He was sad. Yes, yes. Very sad that people put him to death on the cross. That would make anyone sad, wouldn't it? To be treated like that? Have people making fun of him and then hurting him? That's right, and he rose again from the dead. So he wasn't sad forever. That's the thing of all of these emotions. They're for a particular moment, right? But he was sad too, and he looked at the city of Jerusalem, one of the main cities where he lived, and he said, oh, I wish I could have gotten everybody together to be friends with each other and love each other and be at peace. But he said, you wouldn't love me. So he was sad too when human beings didn't always love each other. That made him sad. 
When was he angry? Do you think Jesus ever got angry? Yeah, when the people were trying to see him. Hi, welcome. Good to see you again. Welcome back. So when would Jesus get angry? What do you think? Yeah? Um, when people did the wrong thing. When people did the wrong thing. Excellent answer. Yes. Yes, like one time Jesus turned over some tables at the temple because the people were greedy. They were changing money from one currency to another at the temple so people could buy what they needed for sacrifice. They were charging them money to change the currency and they were doing it because they wanted lots of money for themselves. So yes, when, when people did things that were wrong, Jesus was angry about that because he wanted the best for people. But what about being afraid? Remember we had the afraid face? We were holding up faces with different emotions. This was the afraid face. <laughs> So when would Jesus be afraid? Do you think he was ever afraid too? Not so much maybe? Maybe not so much as us. I think he was afraid just before that. He was praying in the garden, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Because Jesus experienced all the emotions we do. So in that moment, he felt some fear about what was going to happen. But like we said, all of these things pass. We afraid, but then Remember, when he rose again, he felt happy, right? Joy. So Jesus feels all the things that we do, and that's good news, because it means that we can have all different emotions. We can be happy, sad, afraid, <coughs> angry, and it's okay, because we're all human, and we all have all those feelings, just like Jesus did. And it also means that Jesus understands, because Jesus has had all those emotions. So Jesus understands if we're really happy, and he's happy with us. And if we're sad, Jesus understands, because he was sad. Or for angry, all those things, Jesus knows what that's like. So, aren't you glad we have Jesus who loves us and knows us so much? Yeah. So let's say a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for giving us many different feelings because we were created to have a heart. And so thank you for our happy times, our sad times, all of our times, knowing that you love us and you're with us all the time that your son experienced all the emotions that we do. You came to earth in Jesus Christ to walk among us, to feel our feelings and be with us. Thank you, God. Amen. So thanks, guys. And now you can go to Sunday school. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Colossians 3, 1 to 11. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of, those, of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, 
and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, for Christ is all and in all. Luke 12, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. The word of the Lord. Let us stand now and sing our hymn number 399. us from within. We come to be 
inspired and moved to do your work in the world. And now let your word through Jesus Christ instruct us and give us new ways to think about the world around us. Help us to see the world and the people of the world with new eyes. Amen. So, I'll be speaking mainly about the Luke passage today. And Jesus' parable that he tells to the crowd is a warning against greed. But it does connect with Colossians that talks about greed as a form of idolatry. So we'll touch on that too. Be on your guard, Jesus says, against all kinds of greed. So, of course, I, I liked that phrase, all kinds, because it immediately lends itself to thinking about greed in broader terms than perhaps we usually do. So what do we learn about different kinds of greed? Diverse greed. The obvious one we'll get to in a minute that Jesus talks about, greed for things and money, but what about the greed for attention, for power, for status? or control. I couldn't help but think about that one this week as we had this text and in an election year, I don't know if any of you feel the way I do, but sometimes it does seem to, to get people thinking about, hmm, who can we trust? Who's in it for themselves and who's not? And it's kind of hard to answer those questions really because we're not God. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his or her soul? Powerful words when politicians at every level, not just the national level, but lower too, can be tempted by greed, right? Tempted by greed. Do you realize this is a year when both of the major candidates have been accused of greed by people of maybe the opposing party? Each one has been accused of some form of greed. Maybe it's not a bad thing that people make those accusations because it says the American people are thinking about that issue and that they don't want politicians to have self-interest or greed in any way, shape, or form. But this, this greed for attention, power, and status, it's not just something politicians have, it's something that we all can have. But we do see it perhaps uh, highlighted when we watch conventions. We see each candidate making a first appearance, either on a screen or in person, in a very dramatic way. Whether it's one candidate coming out in white light, we are the champions, and the other one coming on a screen with glass shattering. Wow, that's pretty high drama, right? Pretty high drama. And so I said to myself, you know, isn't this a little bit of an encouragement of idolatry? And perhaps for those candidates, it could them up so that they might start to think, wow, I must be really something to have that happen, and wow, you know, gee, and all these people cheering for me. So I'm sure it's at least a temptation for candidates in an election, but more to the point, when we see this kind of high drama at conventions, it can be fun, but it also reminds us that our culture is idolatrous, and our culture encourages a kind of greed for power and status. Just look at the quest for fame, how so many people just want to be really famous, and they'll do anything to get famous. And So it's kind of a reminder that in our culture we tend to do things big, and we have a parable where Jesus talks about bigger and bigger barns. And think of the status that that person in the parable would feel among people around, like I've got the biggest barns around, I've got more grain than anybody. And, they might feel, well, I'm a little more blessed by God because of that, right? I deserve it. I must deserve it, you know? So we can also talk about the greed to be superior, special, better than others. And don't we see that a little bit in our party system with rival parties? We're the best party. No, we're the best party. This is the best candidate. No, this one is, right? So we kind of see that in human nature and in our own system. And while there's a place for that kind of competition and debate and everything else. I think it's also a warning to us about something we can fall prey to. So Jesus says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Ultimately, if we notice that about our culture, then we turn the mirror back on ourselves and we say, okay, how about me? How do I fall into that? 
And Jesus himself was tempted by all the kingdoms of the world and the money and the attention and the dramatic thought of jumping off the Jerusalem temple tower to prove that God would sweep him up and preserve his life. And that would prove he was the Messiah. So he even had the temptation to use theatrics to prove that he was the Messiah, right? But he faced down that temptation. So anyway, that's, that's one tie in I feel with the passage and different kinds of greed. For me, anyway, I find watching the conventions has moments of inspiration, but also concern and concern about our culture. We also learn that greed can be sneaky, greed can be deceiving. It can masquerade as patriotism, positive thinking, positive ambition, and in the parable, even good planning. Here we have a man who's wise. He's had a, a great crop, and so he says, I know, I'll plan ahead, I'll store some for a rainy day. Good planning. So here's Jesus using it as an example of greed, and yet it's good planning. That's powerful too, because we're people who plan, aren't we? And yet Jesus is saying, no matter how much you plan, that's not where your security is because God can change things in an instant. Stock market can crash. There can be all kinds of things happen. So our financial security, our financial planning, our storing up of investments, for example, isn't really security at all. And that might be a little unsettling, and yet what a freedom to know that too, and to know that really it's God who's our security and God who provides for us. So Jesus tries to focus his hearers and us on a different kind of security that isn't about financial security, but it's about a relationship. Having a good relationship with God brings security. God will provide for those who have faith and live their faith. And that's where the security is. It has a lot of implications, too, for churches, I think. It, it's interesting because some churches today are are going into their investment funds to pay their missional apportionments, saying, we gotta help people today, not save it up for a rainy day or for things that we might need as a church. Powerful. It's not a decision everyone makes, and it's something to be made prayerfully, but interesting that some of our churches are doing that. I've known churches doing that, because they said, you know, we can't just store it up like the grain. We need to use it now to help people. And of course, our apportionments include things like Historically Black Colleges, Africa University, World Service Fund for Missionaries, part of our covenant with our connection. So important questions are raised by our parable about, you know, how much do we, are we prudent with money and how much do we generously make sure we do all that missions and then trust God to provide? Tough stuff, right? But it comes to mind as I hear this. But Jesus knows it's hard to live like that, but he goes on later in Luke and he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this theme runs through Jesus' teachings. Trust God to provide. Don't feel that you have to save or hoard or anything like that. But it's hard. It's hard for all of us. Because we're, we're trained by our society to think differently and to be planners. Another implication, though, in this parable about the man with the big barns is that Greed is a lack of generosity, too. And here he had all these barns of wheat, and we don't hear in that parable, and so he invited the poor to have the grain. So he baked, he had people bake bread for the poor. He had, you know, the, the grain distributed. No, we just hear he saved it for himself so that he could take his ease. So obviously the parable is speaking also about when we are blessed, sharing with others. It's an important piece, sharing with others. And also, greed can be distracting and create distance between people. We know, again, that the parable was told to a man who was saying, make my brother share my, his inheritance with me. So then Jesus tells the story. Who was greedy, the one asking to share the inheritance, or the brother who hadn't shared the inheritance? Or were they both greedy? Probably both. Jesus probably thought they both could use this parable, right? 
And that, yet it was customary for one brother, the oldest, to receive the inheritance. It wasn't that they were doing anything out of the ordinary for the culture of the time. So again, that's a warning to us, right? We can do everything just like our culture and think, I'm not doing anything so bad, but we have to go beyond our culture to follow Jesus, don't we? So Jesus addresses these brothers because Jesus cares more about their relationship than their finances, right? But he doesn't agree to be an arbiter between them. He basically throws it back at them, and he says, am I to be a judge between you? He says, you go work it out in a sense. You go work it out. Work out your relationship. Don't let money get in the way of relationship. So that's important, too. Money gets in the way of relationships. Have you seen it? Family and friends, with inheritances, or all sorts of things. Money can cause tensions, right? This one got more than me, that wasn't fair, whatever it is. Sometimes even churches within them fight over money. Who got more in the budget or whatever it might be, right? That happens too. So Jesus is saying, put the focus back on relationships, relationship with God and with other people. Don't let money issues get in the way. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. So there's a letting go that Jesus is telling us to do, a loosening of our hold on money, things, that which we feel we deserve or we want. One of my colleagues this week said, well, it's, it's similar to the Buddhists' non-attachment philosophy, that as they meditate, they're kind of loosening the hold of everything on this earth, detaching a bit, letting go, so that there's a free flow of meditation that encourages that loosening of that hold. And I think as we worship and as we pray and meditate on the scriptures, it's a loosening of that hold. Remember, Jesus told another parable similar to this, and that's the prodigal son parable. Because that one starts out with a brother that demands, I want my share of the inheritance. I want it now. I want money. And I want to go enjoy myself. So similarly, I want money so I can enjoy myself. And then he goes off and he learns that that wasn't so great and comes back and wants the relationship. So that's kind of the sequel. Well, what happens if you take this other tactic? That's what happens. So it's a warning, too. As I said earlier, with watching conventions, if we think it's just politicians who want power, status, and money, then we're wrong. It's really a mirror to ourselves. If we're smart, we'll say, okay, how am I like that? And I know I can look at myself and say, yes, I can find that within me. I can find those aspects of myself, too. And we all can. So that's important that we let it be a mirror to us. We know greed is destructive also. John Lennon said, imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. And while we may not say, imagine no religions, that one verse that we're like, okay, we're not going to sing that in church right now. But the other verses, that it's basically talking about everyone joining together in peace. We certainly pray for peace. But isn't it interesting that in John Lennon's song, he does say, imagine no possessions, no greed or hunger. Because there is a link between peace and letting go of greed, right? I'm sure many people analyze different wars and say, oh, there was greed behind that war. It was trying to preserve our financial interests. And we can debate that on various wars. Was it or was there other reasons? But we do know in general, a lot of conflict happens in the world over territory, over resources human nature, right? But we're called to go beyond human nature, to the divine nature that God can put in our hearts as well through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. So greed is diverse, different types of greed. Greed can be deceiving, greed can be distracting, it can be divisive, and it can be destructive. But we have a better way. We have a better way that we can choose the way of generosity, the way of relationship. So let us pray to embody that spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 Now let us pray our prayer of confession. Oh God, we confess that we have at times neglected the cultivation of virtue in favor of the pursuit of financial security. We have valued money over goodness, the almighty dollar over you, almighty God. 
We have forgotten that our life is from you, and you will call us home on a day of your choosing. Help us to refocus on our inner life, knowing that as we seek your kingdom first and foremost, you do provide for your faithful ones. Amen. Now let's take a moment of silent prayer and confession. O oh God, you have promised that in each moment, in each day, is a new beginning. Thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, and your empowerment to serve. Amen. And at this time, let us make our offerings for the work of God through this church as Caitlin blesses us with song again. Now let us rise and dedicate our offerings to God.
as we offer these gifts to you, so let us offer our lives day to day. Let us get up and say, how can I be used by you today, O oh God? Direct my feet, direct my thoughts, my heart, and my actions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So now we will go to God in prayer. Please be seated. And um, you have a chance to lift up names as well, and I have some that I'll be lifting up today in our prayers. So let us pray together. O oh God, who came to live among us in Jesus Christ, to experience what it is to be a vulnerable, fragile human with all the ups and downs, joys and emotions, the strengths and the weaknesses. Oh God, you who have walked our path, we ask you to continue to be with us in the Holy Spirit. Let the ways of Jesus be our ways. Correct us when we walk off that path, when we are blinded by the razzle-dazzle and the glitter and the balloons perhaps and confetti and all that sort of thing that we see in this this season of high political drama. But we pray that you would instead direct our eyes toward you in humble service, seeking out the ones without any power in the society and lifting them up, and calling those with power and money to accountability. Direct our eyes where you would have us see, Lord. Oh God, we want to pray for our nation, we pray that you would make us a, a nation of justice, mercy, and peace, of wholeness, of healing, bridge division, help us all to say there's no one who has all the answers, no one's right all the time. Break down that false dichotomy of right and wrong when it comes to politics. And know that everybody has a corner of the truth. Help us to be humble in our treatment of others, and our look at ourselves. Now God, help us to remember to pray for others each day. We lift these names now before you that your people raise aloud. Mary, Maureen, and Charlie, Lord, we lift up Carrie Santoro, who has broken her back for healing. Please give her your comfort, Lord. We lift up Yvonne Lumsden's broken finger, too, for healing. Lord, we lift up Norma for continued strength, Eric, Vani for good health, Sandy. We lift up a friend, Anne-Marie, for blessings. Oh God, thank you for hearing these prayers that we lift up today to you. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that your Son has taught us for walking daily in your ways. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our final hymn today is, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's in the faith we sing, 2129. So let us stand if you're able and join in the hymn.
God send us forth to be your church in the world. Let us do the work that your son Jesus started. Let it continue boldly with us. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you.